I thought I would start by saying a couple of words about how I came to write this book. It started, I think, with the 2000 election, um, which was the first, quote, wrong winner election that we've had in quite a long time. And, and what, part of what was interesting about that wrong winner election was that I think the very common preconception, which I think I shared, was that if we had a wrong winner election, that the Electoral College would be abolished immediate, in the immediate aftermath. Uh, so, you know, this could not stand. Uh, as you may have noticed, we had a wrong winner election and the Electoral College uh, was, uh, was still standing. But and I was also surprised by how little fuss there was in some ways about the Electoral College after the 2000 election. Some of you may recall that you one of the few people to speak out immediately about it was Hillary Clinton. Um, and she issued a statement saying the Electoral College has, has got to go. And then she went silent for the next 15 years until she realized that she had been right. Um, but, uh, and I, I began in the aftermath of the election, I began, poke, I had no intention of particularly writing about it. I began poking around in the very large literature. There's an enormous literature of pro and con literature about the uh, electoral college. And when I began to realize that, that what interested me most was the puzzle of why this institution had endured. You know, that, that was, you know, because when I began looking at it, you know, in fact, and as I mentioned in the book, there be some, been somewhere between 800 and 1,000 constitutional amendments introduced into Congress uh, to reform or abolish the Electoral College. That's more than on any other subject by far. As long as we have pu public opinion polls, which goes back to the 1940s, uh, a significant majority of the American population has thought that we should get rid of it. It, in fact, does not serve, the mythologies, it does not serve many of the purposes that it allegedly was designed to serve. And it malfunctions fairly frequently, um, and, or has the threat of malfunctioning fairly frequently. Um, in addition to the wrong winner events, which we're all too aware of, um, you know, as recently as 1968 or even 1992, um, there were three candidates in presidential races, which threatened to then turn the, uh, the decision in the election in, over to the, what's called the contingent election process, which is that the House of Representatives votes with each state getting one vote. Nobody ha that I know of has spoken out in favor of the contingent election system in the last hundred years. Um, and, and it may be more like, more like 200 years, um, but yet we still have this whole system. So that was the puzzle. And uh, the, book, the book is my answer. The Electoral College was not the brilliant idea that descended from the head of Zeus, um, handed directly to James Madison. It was a compromise reached by gifted but very tired men uh, at the end of the summer of 1787 in an unusually hot Philadelphia. The delegates to the Constitutional Convention had a lot of trouble figuring out how a chief executive should be chosen. They did not really, they didn't have models, they didn't know what to do. The default position, as we would call it, was that Congress would choose the president. And at several points in the course of the summer, they had a straw vote and the more and people said, yeah, okay, let's have Congress uh, choose the president. And then within about 20 minutes, you know, people would say, no, that's a really bad idea uh, that, that we don't have separation of powers. It opens up possibilities, you know, of corruption. But they meant they talked or some talk about having a national popular vote. Uh, you couldn't get enough agreement about that. It was thought, thought that the governor should choose the president. So they went around and around with a lot of different ideas. And they got to the end of August. They still hadn't decided. So what would a convention do um, in those circumstances? Exactly what we would probably do too. They, most people left town and they appointed a committee uh, it was the, the Committee on Postponed Parts. And so they left 11 people stuck in Philadelphia to figure this out. And that's who came up with the Electoral College. And what the Electoral College is in its basic design, not counting the contingent election system, is a re it's a replica of Congress that will choose the president, the same number of representatives uh, total as Congress in total uh, from each state. So it's, it's a legislature 
that never legislates. It performs one function uh, and then goes out of business so that the corruption problems are obviated. The institution was malfunctioning and, and unpopular within hours after uh, it was it was created. It's a slight exaggeration, but in the 1790s, it malfunctioned several times. Political parties are formed. They don't fit well with the institution. State political parties start to game the system by adopting winner take all, which is not in the constitution and which most of the framers did not envision and most of them opposed. They believe basically that uh, electors should be chosen by district. There are a remarkable number of efforts to reform the Electoral College in the first third of the 19th century. Um, the focus was to get rid of winner take all uh, and to have district elections and to change the contingent system so that all members of Congress uh, would vote and each would have the same vote. So it was not one vote per state, but roughly proportional to the population. Constitutional amendments seeking these goals were approved by the Senate on four occasions. And in one of those years, it fell short in the House of Representatives by only four votes. It's been commonly said the obstacle to electoral college reform is the small states. Uh, that the small states, because of their extra allotment of electoral votes, do not want to have a national popular vote. But overall, a majority of, of senators from small states favor reform. And actually, among Democrats, it's a very, lo it's a very large number. So what are the obstacles to electoral college reform? They fit into several broad categories. The simplest is that the Constitution is hard to amend. Uh, you need two-thirds vote in each branch of Congress, that's, that's hard to get. The system is so intricate and complicated that it's, it's very hard to change any one part without changing the other parts. So what can be done? There's a lot of ideas kicking around, and I think some frustration with those ideas has also led to a revival of interest in an amendment for a national popular vote or for a proportional system, which some people, including myself, regard as a, as a second best alternative. One reason to be hopeful is that, in fact, I think despite the contentiousness of this period, I think over the very long run, democratic values uh, have become deeper and more broadly accepted. I find it notable that nobody endorses the contingent election system because it's undemocratic. You know, when, you don't have to think any further than thinking about the current election.